So um, probably most of you are at least familiar with the tale, Beauty and the Beast. Uh, the story has a very long history, uh, but there are several identifiable areas wherein most retellings work from a main sort of theme. Uh, the elements of what is expected for it to be a Beauty and the Beast story sort of evolve over time, and that's what we're going to be exploring today. So Beauty and the Beast is classified by the Arne Thompson Uther classification, which is a series of uh, classifications for different types of fairy tales, um, is number 425C. And it's part of the larger grouping of the tales of magic. Um, and then on the subgrouping, the supernatural enchanted wife, husband, or relative. Um, and then 425 specifically is the search for a lost husband. And there are three subgroupings under that, which Beauty and the Beast is the third. So the sort of distant origins of Beauty and the Beast comes from a couple of different Greek myths. Um, one of which is the myth of Cupid or Eros and Psyche, which later evolved into the story that's now known as East of the Sun, West of the Moon, or the Questing Beauty, which is the Arne Thompson Uther number 425A and B. Um, so in this story, a beautiful woman marries a mysterious man she's not allowed to see and lives in a rich palace with invisible servants. When she visits home, her jealous sisters or concerned mother persuade her to find a way to look at her husband and she discovers he's a handsome young man, either a god or a prince, who's then forced to leave because of her betrayal. She must then wander the world and go through many trials to prove her devotion before they can reunite. Uh, the tale of Hades and Persephone is the goddess of spring who's kidnapped by the king of the underworld and then stays there for half a year. Um, and a slightly lesser well-known Artemis and Acteon uh, a mortal man is turned into a stag by the goddess of the hunt as punishment for spying on her while bathing. And you can see three representations of each one of these uh, myths. So just about every culture has a tale of beauty and the beast. Um, there are variants outside of Western European traditions. Uh, so stories of animal grooms or brides, people who were transformed then returned to humanity by their partner's goodness or faithfulness. These can be found in East Asian, African, and pre-Columbian contact Native American stories. So now we get to one of the big ones, the what everyone thinks of as the original Beauty and the Beast. This is the French version. Um, Madame Gabrielle Suzanne Barbeau de Villeneuve recorded a very long salon tale, um, a, which was aimed at adults in 1740. Uh, Madame Jean-Marie Le Prince de Beaumont later, later, later abridged it for children in 1757, and Beaumont's is the one that became the base version for the next 200 years. So this is the next sort of base version after the Greek myths, after Cupid and Psyche. This is the one that everybody points to as this is Beauty and the Beast for the next 200 years. So the basic story runs thus. Uh, Beauty is a rich merchant's daughter, the younger of her, youngest of her siblings. Their father loses his fortune and moves the family to the country. The selfish siblings can't accept their new lives while Beauty, who is their father's favorite, makes the best of things and does most of the work. And it should be noted actually that Beauty is not her real name. We never, we never know her real name. She's just called Beauty. Um, the merchant goes on a journey to try to win back their fortune. The siblings ask for various rich presents, but Beauty asks for a rose. The merchant's trip is a failure, but on the way home, he stumbled on the beast's magical castle where he's cared for by invisible servants, but he never sees his host. The next morning on the way out, he passes a rose garden and plucks a flower. The beast appears and demands repayment for the stolen rose, either the merchant's life or the life of one of his children. The merchant returns home and Beauty is determined to go to the beast castle in his place. Once she arrives there, she's treated as the mistress. Every night at dinner, the beast appears and asks her to marry him and every night she declines. Meanwhile, each night she dreams of a handsome prince and spends her days searching the enormous castle full of riches for him. Eventually she becomes homesick and the beast allows her to return home, but warns her that she must come back before a certain amount of time is up. At home, she finds her father's ill and nurses him back to health. Her jealous sisters convince her to stay longer, note the return of the jealous sisters, um, convince her to stay longer past the beast's time limit. When she does realize her mistake and go back to the castle, she finds the beast dying. She agrees to marry him and he turns into a handsome prince from her dreams. He explains that he was cursed because he angered a fairy 
and she turned him into a hideous monster until he could find a woman who agreed to marry him as he was. At their wedding, which is otherwise a joyous occasion, Beauty's sisters are punished by being turned into statues. So you'll note that there's a few elements from the earlier Cupid and Psyche story that carried over, including the mysterious supernatural husband who's actually royalty, the sumptuous palace with invisible servants, the jealous siblings, Beauty's return home, and the betrayal of some kind of trust between Beauty and her beast that causes them both grief. So in the rest of Europe, uh, variants appear in uh, most of the various cultures in Europe um, and the sort of Indo-European continent. So Germany, Italy, Iberia, the Low Countries, Scandinavia, Central and Eastern Europe, the Balkans, Russia, the Middle East, and India. They are, there are variants of Beauty and the Beast in all of these cultures. Um, a few made the jump to the Americas with colonialism. There are South and Central American, Caribbean, and Appalachian versions that are obviously offshoots of the base European model rather than based on uh, the versions that appear in their original cultures. So interestingly enough, the Grimm brothers don't actually have a direct Beauty and the Beast equivalent. The closest they ever get is a tale called The Summer and Winter Garden, which they actually had in an early edition of their tales and then removed it for being too similar to the French version, so they figured it must not be German enough to include. A few others that uh, they do have that are sort of in the same general family, however, are called The Singing Soaring Lark, um, which is an east of the sun, west of the moon, or Cupid and Psyche direct variant. Um, there's one that's called Bearskin, and there's another one that's called Hans My Hedgehog, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And these are all variants of number 425 um, in the Arne Thompson Uther classification. So in these variations, um, almost all of the story elements that I just discussed in the French version are changed out in one facet or another, but then the rest of them stay the same. So for example, in some versions, everything is virtually identical to the base version, except that the beast dies at the end instead of being changed into a prince. Um, the object that Beauty requests from her father, which is a rose in the French version, uh, varies wildly with different kinds of flowers, plants, fruit, um, and sometimes it's even a pet bird. Sometimes Beauty has brothers and sisters, and sometimes only sisters. The amount of time the beast gives her at home swings wildly from a few days to a few months. The beast, in, uh, as himself, is depicted as many different kinds of animals. There are dogs, stags, boars, lions, snakes, apes, frogs, bears, and hybrids where he's made up of several animals at once. In some versions, the beast demands the first thing to greet the merchant when he returns home and turns out to be the favorite daughter. This is an extremely ancient plot point that many tales beyond Beauty and the Beast use. There's even a version of it in the Old Testament. If you watched season one of the Netflix show The Witcher, this is referred to as the Law of Surprise. A great deal of the Witcher's lore was drawn from Polish folk tales, including this uh, sort of gift giving or gift exchange where the most beloved thing ends up being the, the price. And it's actually that uh, that particular episode of The Witcher is based on the German Hans My Hedgehog, which we mentioned earlier. So now we come to one of the, the big ones, one of the ones that changed everything. Uh, Jean Cocteau's La Belle et la Bête, released in 1946 with a score composed by Georges Auric. This was one of the first major adaptations of the story to film. It stars Josette Day as Belle and Jean Marais as the Beast, the Prince, and Avenant, who we will talk about a little bit later. Uh, most of the story elements from the French version, the, the Beaumont and Villeneuve version, are retained. However, there are a few major additions that are that Cocteau added. The Living Object Servants is one of those things, which is a concession to the live action nature of film. With the technology of the day, it would have been impossible to make the servants completely invisible. <coughs> so Cocteau made them visible by having the objects move about by way of disembodied arms and hands, which you can see in the foot picture on the left. Uh, the magic mirror was an addition of Cocteau's. While not strictly an invention of Cocteau's, there are a couple of versions that have mentioned a magic mirror. Cocteau often included magic mirrors in his films. 
Uh, there were doors to other worlds, they were windows to the subconscious, or they showed things as they really were. Here it's how Belle sees her father ill and the beast dying of sorrow after she breaks her promise to return. It also shows the selfish sisters hideous versions of themselves. And the final ed main addition of Cocteau's is the character of Avenant. Bell's, he is Belle's handsome human suitor, who is the beast's mirror opposite, good looking on the outside, but brutish and selfish within. The metaphor is made real by them being portrayed by the same actor. So Cocteau was an extremely eclectic talent who was not only a filmmaker, but also a playwright, a poet, a novelist, and a visual artist. And he had a fascination with Greek myths, particularly the myth of Orpheus, the musician who descends to the underworld. There are a lot of visual allusions to both Belle and the Beast navigating the dreamlike underworld of the Beast's castle in the movie, as you can see on the left. There's also a direct reference in the film's finale to the uh, story of Diana and Acteon, which I mentioned at the very beginning in our Greek myths section. Um, it's yet another variant on Beauty and the Beast where the hunt goddess changes a man into an animal as a punishment. So pretty much all film and book versions released between 1946 and 1991 pay homage to Cocteau's film in some way. The choice of lead actresses tends to resemble Day and follow her poised, dutiful, soft-spoken portrayal of the character. Uh, the Beast tends to be lion-like in appearance, where before there was, as I mentioned, there was no agreement on how he looked. He could have been a snake, a boar, a stag. There were a bunch of different uh, depictions earlier than that, but after Cocteau, he was pretty much universally depicted as kind of a lion-like creature. Uh, the costumes, especially the beast, tend to be big, elaborate, and covered with jewels and embroidery, and emphasizing how regal he is in spite of his animalistic qualities. He's very obviously visually a nobleman stuck with an animal's face and paws. They also tend to gloss over any explanations as to why the beast was cursed. Indeed, many of them follow Cocteau in a marked tendency to hint that the audience should prefer the beast over the human prince, fuzz and all. There's a famous story that when actress Greta Garbo saw Cocteau's version for the first time, she said, oh, give me back my beast after the transformation. And that's kind of what we're left with at the end of the story. That's sort of the sense that you're supposed to get is that you're actually supposed to prefer the beast. Once again, there are always exceptions to the sort of tendency to follow the one popular base model. Um, but usually the changes to the formula, again, are one or two elements, like beauty having brown hair instead of blonde, while everything else follows the expected pattern. The biggest departure is the 1962 film version, which retains hardly any of the Beaumont story. The Beast Prince looks hideous only at night, and it is his fiance's faithfulness in spite of this that breaks the curse. The 1987 television series also bears little, little resemblance to the French version plot-wise, as the Beast is not under a curse at all, and the themes will revolve around two people who love each other but can't be together because their worlds don't mesh. So now we come to uh, one of the most popular and certainly um, probably the, the one that everybody kind of thinks of now when they think Beauty and the Beast, the Disney version. Uh, released in 1991, animated by Walt Disney Studios, directed by Gary Trousdale and Kurt Wise, and music by Howard Ashman and, Helen, and Alan Menken. Uh, starring Paige O'Hara as Belle and Robbie Benson as the Beast. The cast included TV and stage notables Angela Lansbury, Jerry Orbach, and David Ogden Stiers as the three main servants. This is the most influential version to date. The major changes to the story have stuck and are now expected, with many people now unaware that the base version of the story was any different. These changes include the beast's cruel and selfish behavior being named as the reason for the curse. Before, there was no lesson he needed to learn. It was beauty who needed to learn to see him for who he truly was. Uh, a time limit to the curse is also a new addition. Uh, in previous versions, it's implied the beast has been cursed for some time, in some cases, hundreds of years. The rose retains its importance to the story, but it's basically a magic hourglass rather than the catalyst for beauty coming to stay at the castle. Uh, the beast saving beauty's life and then tur her turning around to save his, which is the beginning of the softening between them. A romantic dance between beauty and the beast. 
uh, a declaration of love as the key to breaking the curse. While it might have been implied in the previous agreement to marry the beast, here it's explicitly stated. The beast must learn to love and earn another's love in return before he can regain his humanity in this version. Uh, the expansion of the role of the castle servants even further from Cocteau, giving them voices and personalities of their own. A uh, mob of people coming to kill the beast as the climax, and finally Belle's siblings have disappeared entirely, as has the beast's nightly proposal of marriage. In this version, Belle betrays her promise to stay in the castle quite early, and returns to care for the beast after he saves her. Later, as part of his redemption arc, the beast releases her without any expectation that he will return. So in the previous version, the beast had asked her to return. That is now gone, and the beast releases her without any, expect any expectation that she'll come back again. So Belle is now, Beauty is now a brunette. Uh, Belle's bookishness is actually a reintroduction of the character trait from the original French version that Cocteau didn't use. Uh, her brown hair, however, is all Disney. Likely made as a choice to distinguish her between the, and Disney pre the previous Disney princesses, Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, who are both blonde. Uh, like Josette did a day before her, this version of Belle has stuck. And now the vast majority of beauties since have been feisty brunettes who love to read. This is illustrated here, as you can see, by two covers of the same book, one published before, originally published before the Disney movie came out. Um, and this is one of the more popular book versions of the, of the story. And then the second you can see here on the, the right hand side um, is a reprint post Disney. And you can see that she's now been given blonde hair or brown hair. And of course, who doesn't love that iconic yellow ball gown, which unfortunately doesn't look good on all of us. Some of our complexions just don't support yellow. But one look at these Cubby's book covers, and even though I have cleverly blanked out the titles, you know immediately that these are Beauty and the Beast retellings. And why is that? Because Belle wears a yellow ball gown like she does in the Disney version. You'll note Cocteau's addition of an outwardly handsome suitor for Belle was retained, though he looks and sounds nothing like the transformed prince. Here called Gaston instead of Avenant, he serves, still serves as a foil for the beast. In this version, as the beast becomes more human, Gaston descends from mere, mere egotistical town hero into a violent and jealous monster. So the Disney movie was immensely popular from the get-go with both critics and the general audiences. A few months before its theatrical release, an unfinished rough cut was screened for the New York Film Festival, and it got a standing ovation. It won the Golden Globe in 1992 for Best Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy, and it was the first animated movie ever to receive a nomination for Academy Award for Best Picture. And this was in the era before the Best Animated category feature existed. It, it lost the coveted statue to The Silence of the Lambs, though it did pick up wins for Best Original Score and Best Original Song. And the film's popularity has remained strong in the 30 years since its release, spawning a long-running Broadway musical, two straight-to-video tie-in video tie films, endless merchandise, and of course the recent 27 live-action film starring Emma Watson as Belle and Dan Stevens as The Beast. And that's just the Disney version. The tale's popularity continues unabated, fueled by how beloved the Disney movie has become, and I count myself among that number. Um, in my Goodreads account online, I have over 120 book retellings shelved, and that's near, nowhere near all of the ones that exist. This is just a small sample of some of the covers. They've all been influenced to various degrees by the base retellings of the past, with the Disney movie having the strongest influence. live action films and TV just in the last decade. Uh, and these are just the ones that are explicitly Beauty and the Beast, not counting the ones like 2016's Deadpool. Yes, really, I'm not kidding. If you haven't seen it, just be aware that it's very gory um, that make use of Beauty and the Beast themes. So then also as a side note, when we're talking about films and TV, um, the Disney movie has spawned quite a few animated rip-offs as well, both long and short. 
uh, in the past 30 years since it came out, and they tend to be hilariously bad. So check them out on YouTube if you dare. And Cocteau got a remake in 2014. Uh, this was a German-French collaboration directed by Christophe Gans with music by Pierre Adenau and starring Leia Seydoux as, as Belle and Vincent Cassel as the Beast. Uh, while it purports to be a remake of Cocteau and it uses quite a bit of Greek myth as well, it was also heavily influenced by the Disney version. Um, it includes the, such elements as the Beast's callous behavior being named as the reason for his curse Bell trying to escape quite early in the movie, and a romantic dance in an empty ballroom between the two leads. It shows how much these things have come to be expected if the story is called Beauty and the Beast. So that can brings us up to the present day. Uh, knowing all of this history, I always have to chuckle whenever I see someone claim that the Disney version or any other recent retelling ruined Beauty and the Beast. The story has evolved immensely in the, the hundreds of years of its existence, with countless iterations that are still recognizable to its audience as Beauty and the Beast. The tale as old as time is both new and familiar each time someone retells it, and it's been that way for fairy tales since the beginning. So that comes to the end of my presentation. So if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. And I've also included some of my sources if you're curious on doing more research for yourself on this fascinating fairy tale.